Hi everyone, welcome to Wild Voices Online. We'll be getting started in a moment. Just while we're waiting for people to join us, I'm gonna put up a poll of a question that you can answer for today. Just for fun, you can let us know which of these wild ungulates, which means animals with hooves, do you like best? Okay, and your choices are elk, moose, bighorn sheep, deer, or mountain goat. All right, great. I see people are joining us and they're voting on their choice there. Um, for those who have just joined us, we're waiting for um, folks to log in. Um, so while we're doing that, um, just a question for fun. You can let us know which of these wild ungulates, which means animals with hooves, do you like the best? Your choices are elk, moose, bighorn sheep, deer, and mountain goat. Okay, great, I can see a few more people have joined us. For those who have just joined us, um, what we're doing while we wait for people to sign in is we're uh, doing a little vote just for fun of which of these wild ungulates, which means animals with hooves, do you like best? You can see your choices up there. We'll give it about 30 more seconds and then we'll get started for today. And in those uh, 30 seconds for those who have just joined us, um, we're doing a little vote just for fun um, while we wait for people to log in um, for which of these wild ungulates, which means animals with hooves, do you like the best? Elk, moose, bighorn sheep, deer, or mountain goat? Okay. We'll give it um, 10 more seconds on the poll for today, if you haven't voted already. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, let's see what you said. Oh, it was pretty close. Um, there's fans of every type of one of those animals here. It looks like moose and deer were actually um, we're actually tied. Um, but yeah, there's people who like um, all of those animals on the list there today. Um, so we will get started. My name's Christine. I work for the Columbia Basin Environmental Education Network. Normally at this time of the year, our educators are coming to your classrooms to do environmental and outdoor education. Since we can't be in your classrooms right now, we're coming to you online on Wednesdays and Thursdays in May and June. And you can find more sessions just like the one happening today at cbean.ca slash wild voices online. For how this presentation will work, you are muted, which means we can't see or hear you. So to, if you have a question you want to ask, maybe you hear something really interesting that you want to know more about from our presenter, you can click the little speech bubble, it looks like this, like a cartoon that has something to say. You can click that little speech bubble and type your question to us. And your questions will only be seen by myself and today's presenter. Um, but please be patient with your questions and just send your question one time. There's quite a lot of you joining us today. So I might not have time to um, get to all the questions. I might just have to pick a few. Um, the questions that come into us, I'll ask them for you when we get to a good pause point for questions. Okay, and then just before we get started, I have a quick question that I'd like to know of what grade you are in. Um, so for the students joining us today, if you could let us know what grade you are in, put some options up there. Kindergarten, grade one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and grade eight and up. You can just let us know. Okay, I can see we've got I think most people have made a choice here. I'll give it just a few more moments, let you give you a chance to let us know. Uh, five more seconds from here. Five, four, three, two, <clears throat> one. Okay, thanks. So today there's students from every j grade joining us. Um, we have the most from grade four. Um, so welcome everyone joining us today. 
Um, today our presenter is going to be Dave Quinn. He's going to be presenting on wildlife in the Kootenays. Uh, Dave is from Kimberley. He's a wildlife biologist and educator um, who's going to be sharing experiences today from his over 20 years of work with wildlife. Um, and I'll pass it over to Dave to get started. All right. Um, thanks, Christine. So thanks to uh, everyone who's made some time on this beautiful spring day to uh, join us. I know we have some some folks from Ontario joining us, some folks from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and tons of friends from all over the Columbia Basin and maybe from the coast as well. So, Kisa um, Kukia, uh, um, I'm in Kimberley, as uh, Christine mentioned, uh, in the Tanaka First Nation traditional territory, and there's some folks from the Sinaix territory to the west joining us and from all over the place. So, um, so thanks very much. So, as Christine mentioned, uh, I've been pretty lucky to have a long career uh, working with, with wildlife is my favorite thing. And uh, so I've uh, worked with uh, lynx, I've worked with badgers, I've worked with caribou, I've worked um, with all kinds of uh, wolverine and other, other, um, other carnivores. And so it's kind of my specialty, I guess, if you will, is to be out in the field working with big animals. And I feel really blessed to live in this part of the world where we still have um, a lot of wildlife and a lot of diversity, but that's changing really quickly. Uh, because there's so many of, uh, of us around and we're not really great typically at sharing our space. So it's kind of one of my missions is to encourage people to learn how to share their space a little better and, and live alongside animals um, and wildlife. And we can do that. We're, we're pretty good at it if, if we put our mind to it. So I'm going to share my screen right now. And as Christine mentioned, if you have some questions, um, please enter them in the chat line just once. Because if they, there's a lot of people, I think there's over 200 people registered today, which is awesome. Christine had mentioned, but um, we might not get to all your questions, but we will try to get to as many as we can near the end. I'm going to uh, do a quick slideshow, talk about some of the uh, wildlife and some of the points I'd like to just go over. I'm going to do a little bit of show and tell. Uh, as you can see behind me, I've got some of the cool uh, treasures that I've found in the bush over the years of, of work. And um, it's kind of, I keep them because I think they're beautiful for one and two, because I use them to Go into classrooms normally to share and uh, let let kids like you um, you know maybe feel some grizzly bear hair or check out a cougar skull and things you might not normally get to see so that's sort of my um, my what, what my collections all about we'll talk about that when we get to that so you should hopefully be seeing my screen and Christine if you can just give me a thumbs up if that's working from your end great so yeah, as I said, normally I get to come into classrooms and uh, you might know me a season guy or Captain Powder. I get to come in in all kinds of different um, different roles into your classrooms. And, and I come in with, uh, with Wild Voices for Kids with um, the Columbia Basin Environmental Educators Network as well. And, and this is one of the programs I get to do. And we live here in the Kootenays and uh, it's one of the few places where you can go for a walk. And this is, uh, you know, a boot with just to the left of it is a grizzly track. You can see the little claw marks in front of the pads. To the left of that, kind of heading upwards in the screen, right beside the grizzly track is a moose track. And then right kind of in between the two of them is a little, what it's kind of hard to tell because it's an old track, but maybe a coyote track or um, some kind of weasel or something that's boogied through there. But it's really a neat place to live here in the Kootenays. And, you know, everything from all the neat aquatic wildlife we have, this is a, a stonefly larvae, some of the critters that live in our, beautiful cold mountain creeks. Uh, the kokanee, the, the wild, the landlocked sockeye salmon that, you know, turn bright red and head up, head upstream to lay their eggs every year. And some giants, you know, this is a historic photo from the Kootenai River. And uh, there's still a few of these big sturgeon left, not very many. They haven't done very well with all the, the dams and the reservoirs that we created. But, um, you know, just the neat things that are living that we don't get to see uh, very often. This is an alligator lizard. We have some incredible uh, cold-blooded wildlife around. So, so our uh, kaha, which is uh, the western painted turtle. This is, uh, this is the alligator lizard here. And moving on up through the bird world. This is one of my favorites. And uh, this, I'll give you a second to see if you can guess what these critters are. Uh, these are giant birds that they nest around the Kootenays, mainly in the, in the East Kootenay where it's drier and more open, but they also nest on our coast. They, a lot of them head up to the Arctic to nest. And these are sandhill cranes. And what I, uh, they have a beautiful call. And what I try to do in the classes sometimes when I go in is teach people how to make a crane call. So I bet everyone 
can do this. So the first step is to just roll your tongue in the top of your mouth. So I should hear a bunch of in the background if I could hear you. The next thing you have to make a sound like this. Hope you're making that sound. Then we're gonna put it all together. The tongue roll, the and we're gonna make a little echo chamber and go. And that sound is out in our grasslands around the East Kootenai right now as these um, beautiful big birds are dancing together, flapping their wings up and down and, and making their nests. So now you know how to speak a little bit of Sandhill Cream. Uh, one of the ungulates that I think should have been on that original list is Nachni. Um, the, and so that the Tanakha name, the real name for, for mountain caribou is Nachni. And uh, they sadly are not doing very well. And we'll talk a little bit more ab about them. We've lost them around Kimberly here and in the South Selkirks as well. So two of our big herds have gone, uh, they've extirpated is the word for it, locally extinct uh, in the last couple of years. There's still animals in there, but there's mostly males and they're really so few that they're not reproducing anymore. So that's kind of a sad story. One of the reasons we still have incredible wildlife is we have lots of mountains. We got lots of places for things to hide. So humans have kind of taken over all the valleys, which are all those long lines that you see going north-south in between the Rockies and the Purcells and the Selkirks and the Monashies. And all the kind of pinkish areas are really big wild mountains still. And there's lots of roads that are, you know, causing some troubles for wildlife for sure in terms of human access. But there's still enough places that things can, uh, can find the space they need for the most part, unless you're a caribou. So it really is all about habitat. And so most of my programs I do, we talk a lot about habitat. And the Kootenays is just blessed with a whole bunch of different kinds of habitat. So right near Kimberly here, um, just in the valley, this is a beautiful native grassland, a place called Wycliffe. And the Tanaka name for Wycliffe, I've been told, uh, equates to hole in the sky. And so it's a place where it doesn't rain very much. There's desert creatures out here. There's badgers and horned lizards and, and cactuses. And within sight of it, there's an old growth cedar forest. It's a very diverse part of the world, which is one of the neat things. And this, these grasslands are spectacular. They are the reason why when Europeans first showed up here, they called it the Serengeti of the North. And the Serengeti, if you uh, have heard about it, it's a, a grassland savanna in, uh, that kind of straddles the border of Tanzania and, and Kenya in, in Africa. And it has an incredible abundance of big animals, wildebeest and zebras and lions and hippos and all that stuff. Um, and the Kootenays is, is or was, uh, it's changing quickly as I mentioned, but was pretty, pretty similar with you know, really big numbers of, of, of big animals because of all the, the food that's here. These are all the, the sunflowers um, that are in bloom right now as we speak in our, in our grassland. It's a beautiful, beautiful show in the spring. And some shooting stars here out in the field. So these open forests, you know, sometimes we think of forests as being really great habitat and, you know, some types of forests are incredible. So other types are, you know, a little bit more challenging for animals, but these open forests with lots of grass, lots of food in them are really special and really important. And it's one of the things we're working hard to protect and, um, and keep more of them around. Some of these older forests, this is an ancient Western red cedar tree over by Creston, a place called Midge Creek. Uh, you know, they can be over a thousand years old and there's just so few of them left and they are incredibly special places. And so some of these trees this is up by Revelstoke, a place called the Incomaplu. And, uh, you know, one of the, that, that name is interesting. I've heard it's because it's from the French, Comiaplu is how it rains. It's, it's the interior inland rainforest that creates the, the conditions of these giant ancient, this tree has been estimated to be over 1,500, 1,500 years old. So pretty special to have, uh, you know, habitat like this in our in, in our Kootenays. And we have an incredible range of elevations too. So this is Mount Toby. Mount Toby is over 3,300 meters, maybe 3,400 meters. And it's right next to Kootenay Lake, which is 500 meters. So over 3,000 meters of different habitats that go from alpine, rocky, open stuff right at the top, all the way down to the old uh, wet forest down at the bottom. And that's one of the reasons, um, you know, people have been living here for 10,000 years. The Tanaka First Nation um, record goes back almost 10,000 or over 10,000 years. And um, people have been able to make a really good living here off of all the abundant wildlife that's here. But it's changing really quickly. And this is um, out uh, the Lucier River near and, and Coyote Creek near Canal Flats. And as you can see, just when 
humans get involved and you know we have these big industries that are very hungry for raw materials um, when you create roads right to the ridges everywhere and, and you remove all the tree cover all at once it's really challenging for some species it could be really good for other species um, if we were able to kind of control it so that these open clear cuts can come back in huckleberries they can come back in a lot of grasses and food for animals but if there's roads everywhere, people can get in there and then the animal's gonna get pushed out. So we haven't done a great job of managing industry and human access. And those are the big challenges that we're gonna talk about a little bit. This is a place called Thunder Creek up, by, um, up in the Rocky Mountains near, near Inverbier. And I think this is one of the things I always challenge uh, young people like you. I think you can probably come up with a way better use for a big pile of biomass like this than burning it. And that's sort of how our industry works right now is we, all the waste wood, um, you know, it's, we do need the industries, forestry is awesome and it does grow back, it's a renewable resource, but we can do a lot better and we can kind of come up with some better solutions to use these things if we're gonna cause impacts. The other thing that's really changed in my short lifetime is uh, highways and how much traffic we have around, around the Kootenays and how fast that traffic is, uh, is, is driving. And so uh, roadkill, um, is a real big challenge for um, for for a lot for a lot, a lot of our species. Right near Kimberley here, we have the Wycliffe Wildlife Corridor. It's one of the highest roadkill zones in all of British Columbia, and it's almost a daily occurrence um, at certain times of the year that we get. This is a, this is a mule deer here, chupka, chupka, and elk, kakatli, um, are all, all killed almost daily. And so we're working really hard to redesign our highways to make room for uh, for animals. So as biologists, we tend to classify things and humans like to classify things. If we've got a, you know, a, I, one of the activities I do in classrooms sometimes, I get everyone to pile their shoes in the middle and we sort them according to color. And some have laces, some have Velcro, and some are slip on and some are, are tie up and, and um, some are runners and some are dress shoes. And so that's what people really like to do is organize things. And that's what we do as biologists. So. Um, as I mentioned before, I really like studying big animals, big mammals. And so mammals are things that have hair, um, they have live babies, they produce milk, and um, we have an incredible abundance of, of large mammals. And so hopefully a few folks have guessed what these are. This is Kienuko, or the, the mountain goat. And we're pretty blessed to have uh, um, these big wild mountain areas. Uh, Kienuko is not doing very well right now. Just because of human access mainly. We find that the areas like the Purcell Wilderness Conservancy, Height of the Rockies, where there's not very many people and no roads, Kinuko is actually doing pretty well. Um, everywhere else outside where people can then quad right up to the ridges and people are building you know, quad roads all over the place, Kinuko has been either pushed out or they get hunted out. And so it's a bit of a, bit of a challenge. Their numbers are not doing super well right now, but they're a beautiful, incredible animal. We have a park named after them in the South Purcell's Kinuko Provincial Park. Uh, this is Quithkli, and uh, Quithkli is uh, the bighorn sheep. And so these two animals have horns. And it's interesting, it's kind of challenging here in the Kootenays in that people kind of tend to mix up antlers and horns. So if it's a horn, it doesn't fall off. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So one of the things I wanted to share with you today was this guy here. So this, my friend Paul found this. Uh, it's a bighorn sheep uh, head from a bighorn sheep that probably died in the winter. Uh, you can see it's been all chewed on from, from laying on the ground. He actually had it mounted to the, the piece of wood that it was laying on when he found it, which is kind of cool. Um, so these will grow a little section every year. They'll add a bit more and they grow all the way around in, in a big curl. This ram was, fifth, was 14 years old. It's all kind of worn off and these guys are really cool. When they fight, they back up and they Boom, they smash their heads together. Um, and maybe, uh, maybe a bit better if I stop sharing my screen and get, a, get a, bit, a bit better look at that thing. So this, as I mentioned, all these little big lines are, are one year of growth on this sheep. It's 14 years old. So Radium has the Headbanger Festival. So in early November, you can go to Radium and actually watch these bighorn sheep button their heads together right on the side of the road. It's pretty, it's, it's pretty exciting. So that's in early November in, uh, in, in radium. And that's 
quickly. So this is Chipka, as I mentioned, and we get from our horned animals, the sheep and the goats, and, the, and uh, we used to have bison here, those are gone. And we also had pronghorn antelope here when David Thompson first showed up in 1811 into Tanaka territory. He, uh, he bumped into pronghorn antelope in the big open grasslands we used to have. Um, but the only two horned animals we have still that are wild are the kinucho and, uh, and, and quickly. Chipka is the kind of middle-sized member of, of the deer family. And they have incredible, you know, big antlers. Most of the deer family, only the males will grow antlers. So this is a, this is a male mule deer buck. And the females are called does. This is um, a kitkatli. So kitkatli is our elk. And elk are one of the most famous animals around here. They're, they number in the thousands, up to 30,000 when the numbers are really big. I think that's down significantly right now for a variety of reasons. Um, but you can see this elk here is in the river and he's growing his antlers. So the antlers, the thing about antlers is they fall off every year. So these elk have to actually grow and these deer and moose and, and, and caribou that we'll talk about. Uh, they spend an entire year eating grass eating vegetation and not only have to survive, put on fat, uh, reproduce, they have to grow these antlers. And I'm gonna do a quick little um, quick little look here. Uh, Kifkathli is pretty pretty incredible. They're some of the bigger antlers that we find around here. Um, and this is a set from the from the, the, the East Kootenays. And this is you know a small bull here, it's a five point bull. Um, very young, immature bull. And we can get some big antlers in the East Kootenay, but in the West Kootenay, where the elk have, you know, another two months of food. You know, winter disappears earlier and shows up later, it's lower elevation. These things are actually hard to lift. So you can imagine trying to grow these. I gotta crouch down, even fit them in um, every year. And so these are, you know, probably 30 to 40 pounds of antler. And this has all just been from this big bull elk, you know, eating, eating grass and convert this to antler, and then every year in April, they fall off. So, and it's one of the neat things that we tend to find if you're out in the right places, is these antlers. Ugh. And I tend to keep some really cool ones that I found, but I don't keep the little ones. If you do, are out, you're lucky enough to find some little antlers, uh, just hide them. That's, uh, that's uh, the little ones, anything that's not super unique or really, really cool, because they're a really important food source for ground squirrels, for squirrels, for chipmunks, porcupines. They get all that mineral, the calcium and phosphorus out of those antlers as well. Let's go back to our... So there's Kit Kathy. Uh, probably this photo I think was taken in June and uh, already growing the antlers again for, for next year. So it's pretty amazing when you do see these winter herds. Um, we have lots of summer habitat in this part of the world. And, and what, that's one of the neat things about logging is that it actually creates more summer habitat for uh, large ungulates. The winter habitat where there's not much snow and the elk can actually get down and find, uh, find food to survive the winter is kind of one of the limiting things. And so we were, we're losing winter habitat like crazy to people uh, building houses and, and um, you know, building roads and all that kind of stuff. So that's one of the things we're working hard to protect. So this is Nipnaku, the moose. And the moose is the largest member of the, of the deer family. They're huge. Um, I'm guessing if I was, I'm, I'm six feet tall, 1.8, 1.9 meters. And I would probably be up to the shoulder of, of, of that moose. They are huge, huge animals. This is a cow moose, a female. And again, the male moose uh, grow antlers. And they grow, I think, the biggest antlers per size, but not, not kind of compared to, the, to, their, to their body size. They're really neat animals. They're not doing very well either. They have a few diseases that have come in. And the ticks are, with climate change, the, the ticks that we're seeing this year on elk, and on deer, um, I've had several reports of elk, um, you know, dying in people's yards and things, just covered. You can't even see elk on, the, on their bellies. There's so many ticks attached to them. Uh, so it's one of the challenges with climate change with these big animals is, uh, is some of the changing um, pest issues that they uh, have to deal with. And again, my favorite, these photos are all taken at Kootenai Pass, which is Canada's highest year-round highway. It was built in 1963. 
And that went right through the critical uh, winter range for, I, I think, all year range for the South Selkirk herd. And kind of was one of the things that contributed to the end of this herd. So once the highway goes in, the logging roads go in everywhere, the snowmobiles go in everywhere, um, people can get in and hunt everywhere. Just the human access makes it really tough for these things to survive. So we've got uh, car caribou or nachni is the, is the real name for them. Uh, the photo on the right top is a bull. Big antlers. Um, you can see the giant hooves really well. They're really well adapted to deep snow. Uh, the photo top left is actually a female. So Nachni is the only member of the deer family where both the males and the females grow antlers, and uh, makes them makes them kind of unique. And they're really well adapted to deep snow and cold winters. So they do the opposite of all the other animals. The elk, the deer. The moose all go down to the valley bottom when the snows show up in our mountains. And we can get two, three, four meters of snow. That's two of me standing on my, standing on my head, um, on my shoulders, uh, deep of snow. And so that doesn't work if you're an elk or a moose. But for caribou, they've got these huge, deep, uh, huge, big um, hooves, and they can stand on top of the snow and eat, eat lichen off the, off the trees. So that hair lichen is on the older forest is a really critical part of their of their winter diet and unfortunately when we get rid of those old forests we convert them to young forests um, you know we got to do some of it to keep the forest industry working but we've kind of converted all of them most for the most part by, by this point so that this for this map here the green spots are where there were herds 10 years ago the yellow is where they used to live and those two big green blobs near Cranbrook and Nelson are gone now and I think the one just west of Vernon is gone now, or just east of Vernon there is gone now as well. So they're really shrinking in their, in their distribution. So what happens when we convert old forest to young forest, as I mentioned, it's awesome for elk and deer and moose. It's an all-you-can-eat salad bar when you get rid of the trees and all the shrubs and the herbs come in for the first 10 or 15 years. The moose, um, Nipnapklu, Chupka, Kithkathli, the elk, deer, and moose all move in. And of course, the predators follow them in. And the caribou are just used to not having that much predation. In the big old forest, there's not tons of predation. Um, they're much easier to see. And so it's just, it's just they get, end up getting eaten a lot faster than they, can, than they can reproduce is the main reason why they're disappearing. So we've had some incredibly great programs that Sea Beans helped out with a fair bit. This is a, a Gordon Terrace School or TM Roberts School. I can't remember, we did two, two collections last year. We actually go out and we collect lichen. And uh, we send the lichen to the Calgary Zoo. One of our, our mountain caribou here, an orphaned calf from up by Revelstoke named Kirby, because he was found in Kirby Creek, is in the Calgary Zoo. And so we kind of help collect the uh, hair lichen for that, that animal and, and help him so he can eat his, his food that, that he's used to throughout the year. And one of the classes from Gordon Terrace actually got to go, and there might be a few of our friends watching today, um, got to go to the zoo to, uh, to connect with Kirby and, and see where all that lichen was going. Really neat project. And of course, we have our, our bears. This is a Nupku. Nupku is the black bear. And Nupku is a little bit smaller than his cousin, but a little bit cheekier. And so people always ask me, do you worry more about Nupku? And I think you know what the, the other kind of bear is. Let's take a guess while I'm talking here. Um, and do you worry about Nupku or do you worry about Klaucha? And Klaucha is the grizzly bear and I, I worry more about Nupku and I, with the, the data I think Klaucha is more dangerous for sure if you get in a tussle with a Klaucha you're gonna get hurt pretty badly whereas you're pretty unlikely to get in a in a tussle with with Nupku. I was talking to I'm, I'm actually starting up a, a bear study in the Selkirks with some bear experts uh, we're gonna go out and collect some hair for DNA I'll talk about that in a second but I was talking to uh, Grant McCutcheon who's, uh, who's a bear expert over there is working on this project he's the, the, the team leader and he was saying, you're so unlikely to get into um, uh, and a problem with a, with a black bear with cubs. They're going to do everything they can do to avoid you. So as long as you let them know that they're there, that you're there, they'll do everything they can to, uh, to either make sure you know they don't want you there or, or get out of the way. Whereas grizzlies tend to be a little more like um, fast reacting. So Klaucha is uh, these big, beautiful bears. And again, they do everything they can to avoid us. Um, I've been really lucky. I've seen hundreds of grizzlies in my life, and almost all of them have been a little bum disappearing into the woods really quickly as soon as it knew I was there. So if you let bears know that you're there, you always sing, la, 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 make, make, some, make some noise, hey bear, ho bear, in the woods, especially if you're hiking near creeks or the wind's coming at your nose so they can't smell you coming, um, you're probably never going to have 
um, a, a, a bad encounter with, with a bear. And so the, uh, I'm just gonna stop sharing for one second here. Some of the other programs that I do sometimes are bear safety programs. And so it really is just a message about, you know, the different kinds of bears, Klaucha, grizzly bear, um, Nupku, the black bear, and, you know, how you avoid encounters with them. And if you ever do have an encounter, you might have heard this rhyme, if it's black, fight back. If it's got a hump, be a lump. Um, because generally, black bears, if you have an encounter with them, they're kind of looking at you as maybe some breakfast. And uh, you have to fight them back, fight back and convince them that you're not worth it. Grizzly bears do not want to eat you in, in general it's super super rare they are just scared and and reacting and trying to protect a food source or trying to protect their cubs or just ah, you just scared them and if you play dead if you get in a tussle with a grizzly bear it will just bat you around and bite you a bit and then leave and so that's sort of uh, one of the reasons we recommend that people carry bear spray with them and it's the most effective deterrent against a bad bear encounter if you have a bear encounter that is just not stopping the bear keeps coming towards you or is just a little too curious and is really invading your space uh bear spray is way more effective than 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 something like, like a gun i have parents sometimes ask me on the hikes that i do with kids what kind of gun do you carry with you and it's like well in a stressful situation with a bunch of um you know agitated people do i want to have a gun with me or do i want to have a bear spray with me and it's 99 or 98 percent effective i think is the stat in terms of like good outcome. The bear stops its any aggressive or curious behavior. And I'd way rather have an accident with this than, than, than with a, a firearm. So this is way more effective if you're heading out into the, into the bush. So Klaucha and, uh, you know, Klaucha, I've again, been super lucky to see lots of these. And it's so neat to see them up in the Alpine. They have these great huge claws and this big hump on their back. And that's for digging. They're digging machines. They eat, a lot of what they eat comes from the ground, whether it's ground squirrels or marmots or roots. They eat a lot of roots of glacier lilies and spring beauties. Um, just like we got potatoes and carrots in our, in our garden, there's wild versions of those that, that help them, help them um, survive. And so this is often where you see them is roaming around in these open areas looking for things to dig up. This is a bit of a Darwin Award. I don't recommend this to anybody. I, I, I bumped into this and see if you can guess what this might be. It's a very large hole. Looks like someone's taken a giant drill and drilled it into the middle of a big alpine basin. And uh, I saw that on a big hike. I was um, up north of Golden hiking and I saw this. That's a bear dam. That is for sure a grizzly bear dam. That is cool. And so on a nice hot October day, um, I, as a, having some knowledge of bears, I was like, that bear is not going to be in the den. These bears have to double their body weight. And that's why bears get in trouble with us. They come out of the dens in April, March, April, and they keep losing weight until there's actually a lot of food around. So it's May, early June right now, there's still not very much food around um, in, in some, of our, some of our mountain valleys. They're just melting off with snow right now. And so the bears are still losing weight. They finally bought them out in July, August, and they've got August, September, October, November to double their body weight. So if anyone knows how much you weigh, you know, I'm pretty close to 200 pounds. I'd have to get to 400 pounds in four months if I was going to survive hibernation. So this bear is not going to be hanging out, reading a book in his den on a nice sunny October day. And sure enough, I went to check this thing out and it was really cool. It went about, you know, 15 feet, um, you know, three to four meters back into the, back into the mountain. And I looked down the hill and there, and there he was. And he just, you know, digging away, eating, just eating as much as they call it. It's called hyperphagia and hyper means crazy. Phagia means eat. They eat like crazy. And that's why if we leave garbage out, if we don't pick up our fruit trees, if we leave our pet food out, uh, bears kind of come into our, our zones and, and get into trouble. And this is a similar map to the caribou one. This is the map of where Klaucha, where grizzly bear used to live, is, is the gray area. Red was where grizzly bears, where Klaucha was in 1920. And then blue is where they are today. So all the way out through Manitoba, all the way down into Mexico. And in 1920, there was still a few pockets in, in the southern states there. The, the state animal for California on their flag, you might know this, is a, is a grizzly bear. The last grizzly bear seen in California was 1924. And so 98% of where grizzly bears used to live in the United States, there are no more grizzly bears. And we're starting to see that around here now. We're right at the southern end in the Kootenays here of where bears can still exist. 
And so the study that I'm working on um, through the spring here is in the South Selkirk, just kind of south of Nelson there. Uh, we're going to sample that area and just see how many bears are, are in there. And the main thing is we want to see that bears from the, you know, the Cranbrook, the Purcell um, population are still connecting across these valleys, you know, the Selkirk. Once these bears get isolated, once their habitat is fragmented enough, uh, they can no longer connect and then we, 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 get a, we get a problem. So this is Kukni, this is lynx. And when I was started my wildlife biology career, we really had to do a lot of capturing and it was fun and it was uh, really inspiring and really neat and an honor to connect with these animals in this way, but really dangerous for the animals. Not, not for me, um, but you know, you really put animals at risk when you're trapping them and you're knocking them out and you're putting collars on them. So you really have to have a really good reason that you need to find out some information on these things. And thankfully now we've got some new technology. And if anyone's ever seen the show CSI, Crime Scene Investigators, uh, you might know that DNA is a way that people solve problems and get information about crime scenes. And so we do the same thing with, with our animals. This is a grizzly bear project that I worked on years ago. And it's kind of similar to what I'm working on this spring. In the middle here is a big pile of what looks like a grizzly bear cache. And if a bear finds a dead elk or a dead moose or kills a moose calf or something like that, or an elk calf, it'll eat what it can. And you can only eat so much at once. It'll bury it. So nothing else can get at it. It's kind of like putting it in the fridge or the cupboard. And then it'll go sleep for a while. So we make a fake grizzly bear cache. We string barbed wire around. You can see barbed wire going all around it. And so the bears smell uh, what we put on this cache for lure. And it's a fermented cow's blood and fermented fish. It's really disgusting. We have cow's blood from a, I'm an abattoir, which is where they kill and process cows, stewing in 45 gallon drums for a year. Um, we pour a couple liters of that and a couple of liters of fish goo. And the fish goo is like, it's disgusting. If you get it on your clothes, you have to throw those clothes out. But the blood is, uh, it's like every cell in your body is like, you do not want that on you. That is so bad, but the bears love it. Um, one of my challenges with this year's project is the thrift stores aren't open. And so my clothing supply is going to be a bit of a bit of a challenge because we just basically use a different set of clothes almost every every week when we're doing this. So we pour that all over the site. We go away for two weeks. We come back in two weeks and we collect all the hair off the barbed wire and we can tell how many black bears, how many grizzly bears, how many males, how many females. If we lay our study out really carefully, we can get a population estimate. Oh, there's 35 bears in this big block. And these bears are kind of still related to those bears across the other valley. Or these bears are totally separate from those. There's no genetic connection anymore. And that's the big red flag for big, big mammals is if there's no connections anymore, it means that these populations are getting isolated and will eventually shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink until they, they disappear. So it's pretty cool. The bears do not even know that they've, uh, that they've been sampled with this kind of new technique. Pretty cool. This is, a, this is a funny, if anyone's been to Golden Kicking Horse Mountain Resort, they have, they had two grizzly bears in an enclosure up there. Now they have one named Boo, and he escapes every now and again. So you sometimes see these, these, these signs up there. The other thing we try to do is teach bears lessons. So typically bears, once they come into human contact and find food, they'll eventually end up at someone's house that doesn't want them there, and they'll get shot. And so uh, the saying is, a fed bear is a dead bear. If a bear finds garbage at your house one day, you might be okay with that and learn a lesson. I'm not going to put my garbage out, but it's going to go to your neighbors the next week. And it's going to go to the neighbor. And eventually one of the neighbors is not going to be putting up with it. So we, um, especially with grizzly bears in really critical movement areas, we try to work with people to educate them that, yeah, there's not that many of these beautiful chlaucha left and we need to kind of make space for them. And maybe uh, this fellow named Phil, he lives down the Yak area, and they used to just shoot the bears. The bears would come in and raid their chicken coop, or it was this one was digging up um, part of it. One of his cows had died; he'd buried it. The bear came in and was digging it up. So instead of shooting them, they call Michael Proctor, who's the bear expert in this part of the world. He's kind of behind the trap there, checking this big bear out in a, in a trap. We can trap him. Uh, we can haul. We can knock him out. Haul him into Phil's garage, and uh, we actually weighed him, knocked him out. That's an oxygen strap on, so he stays healthy. We've had collar on him, um, and this is his way. His bear was almost 600 pounds. It was one of the biggest bears we'd ever we'd ever worked with in this in this part of the world. So you hear all kinds of stories from people, you know, in the coffee shop or whatever. Oh, it's a thousand pound grizzly, and you can be like, "Whoa, were you in Bella Coola, or were you on the coast?" We don't get bears that big here anymore. We lost our salmon here in 1943. 
when uh, the Grand Coulee Dam went in. And I think before then, when there was salmon, we probably had thousand pound bears, but you need lots of protein to get that big. Uh, we have huckleberries. These bears mainly eat huckleberries. And so they get big, but not as big as, as the bears on, on the coast. And then this is kind of a bit of a Mad Max type scene. We've got the conservation officer in blue, Michael Proctor in the plaid, and then a police officer in the bucket up there. And Jillian um, from Caslow with her bear dog. And so we're basically, this is how we teach an old, big, male grizzly bear lesson. We give him a very unpleasant experience. Um, the dog barking dogs, he's been knocked out, so he's probably got a headache. Uh, we're gonna, I'm kind of opening the trap here with the rope, you'll see, and then I open the trap and he gets shot in the bum with some rubber bullets and some bear bangers, lots of noise. And then every time he smells humans or hears dogs barking, he's gonna be like, ooh, that is no fun. I'm not going back there. And that actually keeps bears alive. And this bear with the collar on him, he did not get into trouble for two years that the collar was functioning. So it was a, a, a great success for you. Whereas before, he might have seen the little yellow tag in his ear. He'd been trapped in Idaho already uh, by breaking into cabins and his days were numbered. And so he, this is a really cool way that we can work with um, with bears. The other cool thing that we're doing a lot of, and this is my last few um, last few slides here, and then we'll get to some get some questions, and I got a bit more show and tell to do, is these remote camera works. And so you can kind of see just above the tree that this is a, this is Swa. Who can guess what Swa is? The biggest of the cats. We're very blessed around uh, the cooties. We got all three wild cats. We have Swa. We have uh, Kukmi and uh, Bobcat, I don't know the Tanakh, Tanakh name for, um, the, the real name. So we have, this is Cougar, Lynx, and Bobcat. You go a little bit farther south, there's no more Lynx. So there's not enough snow. You go farther north, there's no more Bobcat. There's too much snow. We have, we have all three of them here, which is, which is really cool. And this is a, a daylight photo of Swa. And the tree, the big tree on the right-hand side of the photo, you see some barbed wire going up. And you can kind of see I've, I've nailed a roadkill elk leg onto that tree and that's the bait uh the lure i guess to, to bring them in and the idea is they come in we can get pictures of them see what's there see what's not and we can collect some hair off the barbed wire and get, again get some good uh, good genetic uh, records and they don't even know they've been sampled so this is from my perspective as a biologist it was really neat and really exhilarating trapping and handling and collaring animals but i really like this stuff a lot better we just go in every two weeks make a lot of noise, collect the camera, get the, get the photos, collect the hair, and the animals don't even know that, uh, that they're being studied. Here's Kukni, another remote camera site. And again, Kukni is just very well adapted to deep snow. So all across Northern Canada, um, they uh, have huge feet, they have the same size feet as Squaw, as the cougar, but this animal is 15 to 20 pounds, and a Squaw is 60 to 90 pounds. So these guys can just stay on top of the snow and, uh, and travel really well in the deep snow. This is skin kooks, the coyote. Had lots of those coming to our sites. They're fairly adaptable to humans. They, these things, um, in big cities, even Calgary, Vancouver, they have coyotes. Even town site in Kimberly here, the coyotes come in and pick off cats every, every, every few nights. Um, and they're really, really cool animals. Very adaptable, very smart, working work, work in, in packs. And we kind of do all this work in the winter time because once Klaucha wakes up and Nupku wake up they come right to these sites and then the last picture you get on your camera is this and this is a uh, Klaucha chewing on the on the camera because that's their job they just woke up they've been sleeping for four months they're like well I wasn't here when I went to bed maybe it's edible and uh, so we t try to do all this work in the in the winter time as much as we can and then we get some really cool things like Aklu uh, the wolverine and we have wolverines that once they find a little bit of a food source, they'll just move in. And we'll have, we'll have thousands of pictures of wolverines. This thing, this thing was at this camera site for about four days, um, just eating every little bit of what it could. They're really cool animals. And they're not doing very well either. They're one of the other animals that needs lots of space, needs lots of quiet, and covers huge distances. These big carnivores, a big male wolverine is 800 to 1,000 square kilometers or more. And uh, they just, they're incredible what, what, they can, what they can do. The Wolverine family, so or the sort of the, the weasel family. The Wolverine is the biggest member of the weasel family. And just see if you can guess how many members of the weasel family we have in the Kootenays. So we have the deer family, got the elk, or the, the sheep family, the goat family, um, got the cat family, the dog family, and the weasel family. And and uh, Mayuk is uh, is weasel in um, in Tanaka. Haha is a skunk. And there are over twelve 
species of weasel in the Kootenays. And the Flathead Valley, south of Fernie, is the most diverse carnivore population in, in, uh, in Canada, I believe, and maybe even North America. Um, all 12 species of weasels, so everything from river otters to skunks to least weasel, these cute little tiny things, um, to marten, to fisher, uh, to skunks and wolverine and badger and minks. There's all, there's all kinds of cool little, little weasel species out there. And they all breed in the flathead and most of them breed throughout most of the Kootenays. They're really cool. Remember, here's a wall of um, Nifnaku, a wall of moose, checking out the camera. And white-tailed deer. White-tailed deer are kind of like popcorn. They adapt really well to humans as well. And so we find white-tail um, are doing, doing fairly well around here. We don't even count them in British Columbia, to give you an example. We are really careful about, you know, caribou and moose and, and elk. We, we try to do inventories, but white-tailed deer, we just say, well, there's lots of them. And they, they seem to be doing pretty well. Hey Dave, just a time heads up that it's 10.45 or 11.45. Okay. Yeah, thanks for seeing that. I'm almost wrapped up here and then we'll do a little show and tell and if you can maybe collate a few questions and we'll try to answer Absolutely. a few questions. And again, this is Klauka uh, here just waking up from the winter's nap and, and uh, we try to wrap up our winter camera work anyways when, when, when the bears wake up. Here is cute little Mayuk troublemakers. They are tough, tough animals. Um, they, uh, I've been known to chase much bigger animals off. There's some great stuff on YouTube about badgers and or wolverines chasing grizzly bears or wolf packs off of kills. They're really tough, the weasel, the weasel family. And it's very interesting. We have to be very careful with these studies because um, this is Kakin, the wolf. And every day on this project, I would see Kakin tracks. They'd be, there's a pack of seven wolves that would work the same roads that I was on. And, um, and, there was at least seven wolves in that study area, but I got one photo out of 14,000 photos or whatever we got that year, one photo of a wolf. That doesn't mean there's only one wolf there. Just wolves are very heavily persecuted around here. They get shot, they get trapped. And so they, I'd have wolf tracks coming down to my, my lure sites or the camera was, and I could see they'd stop. Be like, ah, this uh, smells kind of fishy, I'm out of here. And so we got hundreds of photos of Wolverine, but there's probably two Wolverine in that entire study area. We got one photo of a wolf and there was at least seven wolves that were um that were roaming that area so it's just we have to be really careful with how we design our studies and how we in, in, interpret the data so and as, as mentioned things are changing really quickly here and so when you hear people trying to control access um not have atvs and dirt bikes and mountain bikes even there's some some crazy new mountain bike trails that people are building right through critical sheep range without any permits or anything up in the radium area and so even mountain bikers got to be really careful about how we do things, where we do things. There's so many of us humans around right now that we gotta think about how we share this world with, um, with, with the rest of the, of the critters that need it. So well, maybe while you have a couple questions coming in there, Christine, I'll do a little bit more show and tell here. Um, I mentioned the, 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 the two deer, so the, this, this is a white-tailed deer, and white-tailed deer antlers just have one main beam with all the forks kind of coming off of it and this is when it's growing in the springtime so this was this was hit by a car this this uh this deer and um and so you know normally you can't get the antlers in, in the springtime and i put it in the food dehydrator and uh dried it all out and i take it around to classrooms for education it'll eventually look like this um, once they rub all this velvet off it's all just full of blood and nutrients it's just these things are when you find these things dead on the side of the road, you can actually feel it humming almost. There's just so much life and so much blood going out to grow these things. They have to grow these things in you know three or four months. So this is not super impressive, but you think of those elk antlers that we looked at, that's pretty pretty incredible. So that's uh, white-tailed deer. And they're a little bit smaller than our, our, our mule deer. And so the, the mule deer are a bit bigger animal and they fork. So instead of having one main beam, they, have, they, they go into a Y and they do another Y. And then if this, animals survived longer it would be it would get another another fork near the end potentially maybe more in the middle um so chipka the, the the mule deer is a bigger deer bigger antlers and has the the Ys. i also have again the moose are very interesting so they are the biggest antlers but the elk are, are bigger compared to their body size and they have these big palms or or, uh, or paddles, some people call them. So a big flat area with all these you know, arms coming off of them, spikes coming off of them. And uh, again, only the male moose grow antlers. This is a small one. They can be just, just huge. We have 
kind of the second smallest moose around here. If you go up to Alaska and the Yukon, the moose up there are just, they're massive, you know, well, well over a thousand pounds and, and antlers that would be, you know, to, to there potentially. So, and then, well, I forgot to mention, I actually put on my, uh, my, my moose poo necklace for, for today. So just to, just in, in, in the honor of this, this occasion, um, the, the nachni caribou. So both the male and the female caribou will, will grow antlers and, um, you know, they're gone from the, from this part of the world. Very, very sad. And we're working really hard to try to keep them around in other parts, but caribou doesn't matter where you are. If you're in the Arctic with the barren land caribou and the Piri caribou, uh, if you're in the, you know, out East with the, the, uh, the boreal caribou, you're down here with the mountain caribou, uh, you're in trouble. And uh, there's some of the big herds up north, the, uh, I think it's the, the Bathurst herd, was something like 400,000 animals in the 1990s. Huge herds of animals, that's the animal that's on our quarter. It's down to 4,000. So it's uh, like one, less than 1% of, of, uh, of the animals. So the caribou are in real trouble and it's just they don't adapt to humans very well. So that's, that's not neat. And then some of our, our predators. Uh, see if you can guess what predator this is. It helps look at the profile. It's got a very flat face. The eyeballs are right in the front, so it's made for hunting. Uh, you'll find with prey animals, their, their eyes tend to be on the side, so they can see what's coming. They can see behind them a little bit. Uh, and it's just got teeth that are made for shearing and cutting. They're like little knives. So this is swa. This is a this is this is a, a cougar skull, and it's very different from, for example, and again, these are all just things I found out out, out in the bush. Um, so we're out, we're in the bush. Look, look around, stop and look, and look on the ground. If you see anything white, it's always worth checking out because it's it's usually a bone of some kind. See if you can guess what this character is. This character obviously has some big teeth in the front for grabbing and chewing it, but it's other teeth. If you run your tongue along your molars, you'll find they're almost exactly the same. So this tells you that this animal eats the same stuff that we do. And these teeth are just as much for battling and fighting other animals as, as they are for, for, for eating things. Unlike swa, where these teeth are for battling other animals, but they're for catching food too. So this is Nupku, this is a big, I believe anyways, um, I haven't done a DNA test on it or anything, but um, I believe it's a Nupku, a big black bear. And black bears are like us, they're, they're, they're kind of like our cousins. They, uh, they eat lots of berries, a little bit of meat, a little bit of uh, plant material, just like, just like most, most humans. So they were called omnivores. And, and what else do we have? These are uh, one of the coolest animals. This is one of the reasons we have this thing called Canada. See if you can guess. It's got these really cool ear canals that point up. Maybe so it could get above the water to here. It's got these big teeth on it for chopping things. Grinding teeth, very different from the, this business missing a lot of its teeth, but very different from the, um, the other teeth we were looking at. And this is our beaver. And this is a, this, this is a, a young one here. And, but this shows you here, I pulled this tooth out. This is why beavers need to keep gnawing because these teeth keep on growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. I can't actually push it back in, but it goes right back in. And that's why they have to keep gnawing and, uh, and, and, and chewing on trees. And I've got a bit of beaver fur here. And this is you know why this thing called Canada showed up. And or one of the reasons anyways is this critter called the beaver. It has the most hairs of any animal I think on the planet except for maybe a, a nutria which is another animal um, from South America. But it's got these long guard hairs, the kind of reddish ones, blondy ones. And then underneath you can maybe see the, the some of the fleece in there. And that's what people love. You shear all these things off and you get the softest thing on the planet. So everyone in Europe in the 1600s, 1700s wanted beaver skin hats and mitts and you know, frills on their coats and everything. And so they, one of the reasons that people came all across what's now called Canada um, was to trap beaver and try to make a bunch of money. So, so Christine, maybe we could take a couple questions. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, I think the first question I'll ask here is, um, some people were curious about the, some of those pictures, the animals were really close to the camera and they're curious, were you there taking the picture or how did you get so close to the animals oh, like that? Yeah, good question. So um, the ones that were at the end of the slideshow are, are what's called a remote trigger camera. So it's a camera that I actually strap onto a tree and then it's kind of like our motion sensor lights you might have in your yard. When something walks through the yard, the light turns on. Uh, when something walks near that camera, it'll trigger it to take a, take a picture. And so the ones near the end that were black and white um, and had kind of labels on them, those were from remote trigger cameras. And that's how we get so close without uh, disturbing them. All the rest of them, the color ones earlier on were just from me being lucky. I used to take a lot of photos. I don't take quite as many anymore, um, but you know, I've just been really lucky with some of the work I've done to be out and be able to you know, sit and animals will come close to you or you can kind of sneak up on them and get some photos. And um, yeah, it's kind of a neat way to uh, experience wildlife and learn more about it is to, is to, um, to get some photos of them. So yeah, good question. All right, and um, some folks are wondering if you have a favorite animal that you work with. Good question. I often get, uh, we play this um, with my family a lot. What's your favorite animal? If you could be anything, what, what would it be? Um, and I, I think my family has kind of uh, labeled me as part grizzly bear. Um, just a little bit due to my eating habits. I'm a bit addicted to huckleberries and uh, I'm not exactly the kind of person you want to let free in like a fine china store. Um, so I, th I would have to say that grizzly bear would be one of my, my favorites. Um, you know, they've just been pushed right to the very back of our, of our mountains. You know, they're living in the mountains, not, necessarily by choice it would have always been grizzlies up there but historically grizzlies were down our valleys they were eating fish they were eating all the really productive food down here they were right out on the prairies um i think it was palliser's expedition in 1853 they shot five grizzlies in, in, in one day in cypress hills in um in southern southern saskatchewan i believe um and so that and that's why right out right out in the prairies and so we've pushed them right to the very back and so if there's grizzlies still in an area it's a really cool indicator that it's a pretty a pretty wild part of the world still and that's my favorite places to uh, to try to protect and to try to experience are these last little wild pockets mm -hmm. um and actually that relates to another um bear safety question i got in um is um what do you think about other types of um bear deterrents that make noise as well like bear bells bear bangers are those helpful yeah i think um that kind of brings you back to that um the, the biologist joke of like how do you tell the difference between black bear poop and grizzly poop and you know black bear poops all kind of full of mushed up berries and leaves and then grizzly poops kind of full of little bells and smells like pepper <laughs> um no the, the the bear bells i don't think there, there's not a, a whole bunch of um you know research research saying that they're good one or bad one way or the other they can't hurt that's for sure and i think anything especially if you're hiking quietly anything just lets things know that you're coming um is gonna um minimize the chance you're going to surprise a bear that's the only thing you got to think about is i do not want to surprise a bear and you know if if you have some bells you're singing um that's a good thing the, the other noise makers that i've used in the past are bear bangers and that's mainly when you're i mean use those in the arctic where we're dealing with polar bears which are they're not like our cute little nupku and klaucha down here they're spreaders they just eat meat and we're just basically hairless seals and so um they are more likely to be looking at you as a food source and so um, you know, the bear banger is just a little pen thing that you pull back and it has a little launcher that shoots something out and goes boom, makes a big noise. Uh, air horns, I've heard people using air horns. A lot of camps that I've worked in, tree planting, uh, air horns have been really effective if you do have a situation where you're likely to be bumping into bears. So that making noise to let them know you're coming is one thing, that's awesome. So bells can't hurt, singing, making noise. The bells are so quiet though, if it's, if it's windy, you know, I think you want something a little bit more just like, and if it's ever really shrubby out or I'm walking into the wind or by a trail or, a, or by a creek, no, a trail by a creek, I'm just like, hey bear, bo oh, bear, coming through, or I'm singing my favorite song just to kind of let them know that I'm, I'm coming. So bear bells can't hurt if it's, you know, not windy and quiet, but you want to make a bit more noise than that. And then the other noise to turn is the air horns and the, and the bear bangers and things if you do have a bear that you're having an, an, an encounter with. And they, 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 my experience is they, and some of the data shows that they can definitely help break an encounter that is not going the way that you want it to go. So 
hopefully that answers your, your question. But the, again, this, this bear spray is just the, the last ditch, really critical thing to have with you on your mountain bike. Um, you can get these little mountain bike holsters that fit in, fit in a water bottle holder. You, um, and you don't keep them in your pack. You know, at the times that I've needed this, it's like, well, I needed that about two seconds ago. And you're busy, even if it's easy to get to, you're fumbling with it and it's pretty stressful. So you kind of want it in a holster, either on your backpack or I, I carry a holster on, on, my, on my hip. Um, just so you can get to it quickly and the chances that you're going to need it are almost none um, and uh, unless you're someone like me who does that's what I do for fun is go wander around in the bush looking for stuff and, and I do it for work as well and uh, so if you carry that and you make some noise you will this is very 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 out of how, out of how many varies you want uh, chance you're going to have a bad bear encounter. All right thanks Dave. Um, probably have time for a couple more questions. Um, I had uh, questions wondering if you have a favorite of your um, sort of wildlife samples or one with like an interesting story behind it. Well, it's, it's interesting. I was really lucky to work on the South Purcell mountain caribou project. Um, and all that's what the neat thing of we're working with these guys we were setting up earlier this week for this grizzly project next week. It's just story after story after story after story. And that's one of the neat things for me of working with wildlife is they're unpredictable. You're out in beautiful places. You have, you just, collect stories and you know I've been treed by moose I've been uh, you know I've had grizzly bears you know walk through I've had elk step on me I've just if it's been just so many neat um, neat experiences but I think for me you know I really like the grizzly work but the blood and fish goo is gross enough that it's not my favorite um, it's uh, it's so nasty but I'm still getting to hike to these beautiful places and get to know little areas and see all kinds of uh, crazy things um but the caribou project was so neat and that it was basically the, the nachni they're hanging out in these little hanging high intact valleys where nobody's going where there's no roads either big old forest beautiful stuff or big open alpine basins in the summertime and so i was getting paid to go walking into areas that i would have gladly gone on my day off anyways and uh, i didn't have to carry anything stinky or rotten with me and i just had to do a little bit of work and gather some data very carefully while I was there. So the Caribou Project was probably the most enjoyable project I've ever worked on. It was the saddest. Um, we started the project, we had about 150, 100, 150 animals in the South Purcell herd here, and that was declining drastically at the time. That's kind of the typical BC approach. It's like, oh, things are almost gone. Maybe we should study them. Um, and our collared caribou were in these last little drainages that hadn't been logged. And, and uh, the first year, there'd be flagging tape into those drainages. The second year, the road would be in. And the third year, it'd be clear cut, and the caribou would be in the next range, and the flagging tape would be in, and the road would be in. So that's been that was the really sad part of it was just feeling pretty helpless that we're doing all this work, and it's and it's still we're modifying the habitat um, unsustainably. So best and and worst, but yeah, we I could go on for about incredible stories of you know wildlife encounters and stuck trucks and um, you know flying squirrels zipping by my head while you're walking through the through the forest, all kinds of neat things that you just yeah, you just don't get to have if you're if you're living in town. So, yeah, and I wish we could have more time to hear all of those stories from you today. I I'm sure there's so many interesting ones, but I think it is pretty much about that time for us to wrap up. Maybe just um, one last question to end with, um, if you want to answer quickly. What inspires you to work with wildlife? Uh, I've just always um, like when I was young, I read too many James Harriet books, and if you're a young reader, James Harriet is a he's, he's a vet in England and a very funny writer and I encourage you to read some of his books and that I think helped instill a love of animals in me. I always wanted to be a veterinarian um, and then I just by the time I finished all the lead up to vet school I just had done my five years of university and I was kind of done vet school is another four years and so I, uh, I ended up working with a bunch of wildlife projects uh, just because I wanted to be outside and working with animals and that just I just realized that that's where um, you know, my heart wanted to be it was just outside in wild places, working with animals and trying to do what I could to make sure that there's there's space for them. And so that's now I'm doing more education work and working with young people like people who are on the on the on the uh, on the call here. And um, yeah, I just empower you just to you know do whatever you can to you know protect wild spaces. If you uh, you know you have some ideas of protecting even little wild spaces around, around your house are worth are worth fighting for and worth uh, doing what you can to try to make room for the animals that we love um, on this planet. I just think it'd be super lonely if we start losing too many more of them. 
All right, thank you so much, Dave. That was a super interesting presentation. I learned so much um, and it was so great to see all of your, uh, hear about your research and see all of your um, super interesting photos. It is time for us to wrap up for today. In the chat, I sent out the couple of links that um, Dave shared for us um, for ideas for things you could do after his presentation. If you wanted to click on those right now, you could take a look at them. They'll also be emailed to the uh, email address that you registered with tomorrow. So if you um, don't click on them now or you uh, click on them but lose those later, they'll also be emailed to you tomorrow. Um, so that's our time for today. Thanks so much again, Dave. And thanks everyone for joining us. All right, thanks everybody. Have fun out there. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.